Hello, I'm Stuart. Hello, I'm Liam. And this is the Strange Magic Podcast, Episode 4. We're going to be talking about Dungeons and Dragons and Death. There's a, there's a third one now. There's a third part to that name. D-N-D-N-D. Yeah. So, to start things off, the question is, is it okay for PCs to die in Dungeons and Dragons? I've seen some discussion where people say, absolutely no, and some people say, yes, or you're not playing a game. So is it okay for PCs to die in D&D? I think that D&D, especially being the type of game that it sort of is, it's sort of assumed that PCs are going to potentially die, especially if you like make a bad decision, or even if the dice just aren't on your side. There's that chance, and that's part of what makes it fun. So I feel like if you really don't want your character to die or you're trying to run a game where characters don't die, maybe you shouldn't be playing D&D and instead be playing something else that's less lethal or at the very least be doing something with homebrew because as written, people are going to assume that your character might die. It's already in D&D once you get up to higher levels, especially in some of the newer editions. It's super easy to like revive dead player characters. Yeah, it's in the rule book. So I think that... With all of that rules, all those many pages of rules about what happens when you drop to zero hit points, healing, death, it's right there in the rule book. So to suggest that you shouldn't have characters die in D&D runs completely contrary to what's in all the books. And I think short of having some sort of conversation or folk tradition, I guess you could say, that <laughs> in all your, your games, the characters don't die. I think just based on what's in the rule book, um, it, it's quite a, a statement to say characters shouldn't die in D&D. Mm -hmm. I think if you didn't want them to die in D&D, you, you would be better to play another game or at the very least have a highly homebrewed game or a conversation or something. Now, I've also seen people say it's hard for players to die in 5th edition. Player characters. Mm -hmm. I mean, hopefully it's hard for <laughs> players to die. This DM <laughs> is not is not up with this he's, anymore. He's had it with the yeah. rules lawyering. <laughs> and he's not going to take it anymore. So is it hard to kill player characters in 5th edition? From experience, I'd say definitely not. I feel that in 5th edition, there's a lot of like swing when it comes to how much damage certain things can do, sort of how lethal everything is. Even the player characters can be like wildly different in terms of their sort of skills and their sort of um, competence sort of per level. So I find that it's actually really easy to, to kill like player characters, especially uh, even if you have something that wasn't meant to be like a sort of difficult encounter. It's still very easy to end up killing a player character from that. I've had... Um, sessions where I, I thought that it would be a big monster showing up and people were just fine with the big monster in 5e. They took it down in a couple of rounds. And then there's been times when forced like goblins showed up <laughs> and just <laughs> nearly killed everybody. Yeah. And the only reason that people weren't dying is because people started like surrendering and like laying down their weapons and all this crazy stuff because four goblins ambushed them in the woods. So yeah. It, it depends greatly on even who gets initiative first can change it drastically. Because if, if the fighter goes down, it's a bunch of wizards and some goblins throwing like javelins at them, shooting at them with bows. It's not going to be good for the players. I think if the players have a well-balanced party and solid tactics mm -hmm. and don't mess around, it is more challenging for them to be killed than in previous editions. I'll, I'll give you that. But I've played a lot of games where there's no cleric in the party this week. It's, it's two magic users and a thief, and they're ready to go. Or they split the party, and someone goes <laughs> off into a dungeon with just a, their dagger and no torch or something like that. And mm -hmm. you, you really want to do that? Yeah, yeah, I'll be, I'll be fine. I'll, I'll be, be fine. fine. Or they decide to run away from a monster or something. And I, I don't want to discourage that because it, it feels cool and cinematic and when I say cinematic I mean like the characters are going to get killed off in a horror film cinematic <laughs> <laughs> not necessarily the latest uh, action hero cinematic <laughs> um, you're watching like the Avengers Thor just gets up and runs <laughs> he just runs away no I'm, I'm thinking more Burke running away from the aliens yeah. and aliens but uh, 
I think that it's definitely easy for characters to die in 5e if they don't have other party members nearby to stabilize them. Some of the monsters are ridiculously tough compared to 1st edition. An orc in 5th edition is rolling d12s for damage. And the characters, yeah, they have more hit points than in 1st edition, but they go down pretty quick. And if they don't keep their distance, they don't use the healing magic, they don't stabilize their allies, they run through the the dungeon like they're trick-or-treating, opening every door. I've seen a lot of characters die in 5e. Now, it really does depend on your players, and I I think that they are more durable than early editions, Mm -hmm. and I think that's one of the complaints people have of early editions, is if they don't want to play safe, (laughs) um, (laughs) the, the characters go down pretty fast. Yeah, I find that death saving throws also adds an, another sort of dynamic to that, mm-hmm. where if somebody drops to zero, they're not necessarily dead. Although I have been, I, I've sort of encountered situations where I've been running a game in 5e, and a monster that's sort of supposed to be not not super tough, but also not weak, um, ends up scoring a critical hit. And at one point, there was a Grey Ooze, and the party decided to attack the Grey Ooze. I'm not sure why. It was just sort of there. They could have went around it, but they they did. And somebody charged it in melee, and it critted against them. Mm -hmm. And they were, if you go in 5e um, to negative what your hit point total is, you just instantly die. I think the player, his character had like two hit points away from just instantly dying, going from full to instantly dead. And he was, like, level two at this time as well. Mm -hmm. I think it was, like, rolling multiple, like, eight-sided dice for the attack, adding, like, a big modifier. It was, yeah. (laughs) Yeah. And I, I I think it really does depend on the play style of the group. And it's not just once, but multiple times I've, I've had players do suboptimal things and all of those stories about you can't kill 5e characters, it's, it's too hard, that's all out the window because they run into situations they, they shouldn't, they're, they're not prepared. And But I don't want to discourage that because those make for good stories. Like you're telling that story of the <laughs> player who charged the Grey Ooze now. We had a, another player who got spooked by uh, the smallest construct, I think in the whole game, it was an animated sheet of paper. And yeah. he got spooked by that. So he ran off down uh, a, a corridor by himself and he got jumped by a constrictor snake and uh, <laughs> there was no one there to help him. And so he got the, he got the life squeezed out of him. And that's, that's how it goes. But what do you do then when you have character death but also sensitive players? And I've seen that suggested a lot. What if, what if the person for whatever reason, is more sensitive than the average person. What, what do you do then? I feel definitely if you have sensitive players, it's one of those things that you should sort of talk about at the beginning of the game. And especially if this, if this player is sensitive and they don't tell you that, I feel like you're not in the wrong for killing off their character, even mm-hmm. if they get upset afterwards, because they should have voiced that beforehand, that that would make them upset. Mm-hmm. And... If you're playing something like D&D, that's sort of expected. That's part of the rules. Like you said, Mm -hmm. it's a core part of the game is that your character might die. So if you go into this game where your character might die and then you get upset when your character dies and you didn't voice this beforehand, that's it's sort of strange if you're then going to turn around and get all mad at the the game master, the the dungeon master who's just following the rules. It would be like if you were playing Monopoly, somebody (laughs) lands on Boardwalk, they buy it, and then you're like, no way, you're not, what, people are buying Boardwalk in this game? Mm -hmm. Why would people buy Boardwalk? Why would they do it? Like, yeah, if you're if you're playing, uh, it, it's called I think it's called Trouble in the UK, and I think they call it Sorry here, with a, the Popomatic bubble. Mm-hmm. And if you land on the other player, their piece has to go back to the beginning. And if you're very sensitive, maybe you're young, or maybe you know you have emotional extra challenges in your life or whatever, that could be upsetting for you. Mm-hmm. And you might decide, you know what, I don't like playing games where I'm going to be made to feel like that. And so for you, you know, as that extra sensitive person, 
that may not be a good game for you. Mm. So you, you may need to talk with the people playing a game that includes a whole section <laughs> on character death to say, this this isn't what I'm looking for. Is this still a good fit? Can you still accommodate me here? Mm-hmm. Now, I ran D&D for a lot of kids, and that was a, about a three-year-long campaign, which I've mentioned before. And we had players as young as, I think our youngest player... She was six when the game started. She was there with her mom, and she got older than that during the the course of the campaign. But we had six-year-olds, seven-year-olds, eight-, nine-year-olds, and I don't think anyone had a temper tantrum or cried. We had one player get a little upset because he felt frustrated. He didn't know all his options and stuff, and his dad had to talk with him about that. But we didn't have anyone... We had 12 character deaths during that time, and no one freaked out or got overly upset. And I think part of that is you set the the expectations early on. So mm-hmm. for our game, all the dice are out in the open. So mm. the players know, oh, all those dice rolls are out in the open, and the numbers are all what they are, right? Like mm-hmm. you, you roll, and if I get higher than a 13, it's going to hit you. And now I'm going to roll this eight-sided dice. You're going to lose that many hit points from your character sheet. They can see the numbers, so they have an understanding of the sort of risk Mm -hmm. factor in the game, and they can make choices around that. And we had some players that played it really safe because they didn't want their character to die, so they they would hang back and not take big risks. And we had other ones who <laughs> they didn't <laughs> they didn't play it safe, and so they would they would you know do do bold foolhardy things, but they also didn't get upset if their character were to die. Yeah, I I feel like not only just rolling your dice out in the open, but also expressing what exactly you're rolling for Mm -hmm. is one of the best things you can do, especially to have that trust with you and your players. Because if they know that you're not out to get them specifically, but the dice might dictate that like a monster does get them, they're not going to feel upset with you as a person afterwards. They're going to be like, ah, those, those dice, those dice out to get me. That's a really good point. Even if you're playing like an, in an adventure, right? And somebody's like, I want to jump across that gap. And you know that there's a big like drop and then a spike pit at the bottom. And they will probably die if they fall. Voicing like, okay, you're going to need like a 13 or higher to jump this thing. Are you sure you want to do that? And so then you've given them the number they need to achieve. That's they right. know the risks. And so they're sort of able to be more well-informed with that. And they don't feel like they've been sort of deceived almost. Yes. Yes, and I feel like when you do that, you can also cheer with them. Mm-hmm. You're, you're telling them, okay, you need to roll a 13 or higher. I want you to roll a 13 or higher. I'm with you in this. And the players all gather around. You're there with them. Everyone wants to see that dice come up 13 or higher. And so you all share, including the dungeon master, in that success or bitter failure of, mm-hmm. of it not going well. And that's where you get the cheer, the groan. And I think it's really useful for them to understand. I mean, I think what's not very satisfying is roll some numbers. You don't really know what you're rolling for. Yeah. And then there's a little bit of accountancy in the corner. And then uh, add the two and uh, multiply by this. And, uh, and your character's dead. <laughs> I mean, that's very unsatisfying. That's... That's part of the reason why I I have the third edition books. Mm -hmm. I've never played third edition. I've read them. I've Mm -hmm. never played third edition because there's just so much of that. And it's a fun game to make characters for. Yeah. But actually playing it, it feels like that would be sort of amplified. Yeah. I I think you can, if you could do the numbers ahead of time, like I always like to know before the dice is being rolled. I like myself Mm -hmm. and the players to know what the result of something is. Like if your character is going to die before we roll this dice, I want you to know what's good, what's bad. Mm-hmm. And, and then as soon as the dice comes up, we know. Like, I don't want it to come up, and then there's a little furious <laughs> bit of, you know, accountancy and doing your taxes. Dead, but we don't know. <laughs> yeah, we'll, we'll get back to you on this. And then you, know, you have to say, your character's dead. And it's it, it doesn't have that same moment of excitement, and you you don't have that feeling that it's the dice who did it. You feel like it's the mathematician who killed my <laughs> character. So yeah, I, I do prefer that. You have to like put on like your black suit, knock on their door. <laughs> yeah, I've got some bad news yeah. for you. <laughs> Thorgar the fighter, he didn't make it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now, we also came up with another technique in our home game, which uh, I really enjoyed. And I think that was you and your friends were were, were messing around and, and you'd start singing a little song. And then that, that 
progressed to was <laughs> finding a music track and queuing it up and playing it anytime a character died. <laughs> and so even when it sort of stung a little bit that, you know, oh, my favorite character, he just died. It was so ridiculous um, <laughs> that it was it was hard for people to feel too upset. And we got to a point where we, we were playing the uh, the What You Say music clip from the <laughs> Saturday Night Live skit and everyone would would salute <laughs> like we were playing tabs. We would salute the dead character. <laughs> and I remember looking over at one of your friends whose character had just died and he, he looked sad at first, but then he he started like like chuckling and laughing because it was just so silly. <laughs> and so I think some sort of little ritual around it, which lightens the tone a little bit is helpful for people who might be a bit more sensitive about it. It reminds them that we're all playing a game. It's all mm -hmm. in good fun. And don't worry about that too much. I do think if you had a player who came to you and said, one of my grandparents just died, mm -hmm. or I had a, a pet just die, and I'm looking to this D&D &D game to take my mind off of that, that might be one of those situations where you want to do either a different game or you're talking about house rules, or you're maybe going to do a little side quest where there's not a lot, <laughs> there's not a lot of risk of, of death in the game. It's like the, it's the beach episode, or it's the shopping episode. or Exactly, <laughs> exactly. And I, I actually really like those. I tend to prefer shorter sessions uh, instead of like mammoth, you know, six or seven hour long sessions. I like mm -hmm. two hour long sessions. And those are really great for even when I'm, as the DM, not 100% there for whatever maybe i had a hard time at work and it's it's nice to have those those little interstitial like you said the, the shopping episode or dragon ball they need to learn to get their driver's licenses <laughs> or something like that and you have one of those those separate from the main storyline we had a, a festival episode in our game where there was a lot of funfair type games tug of war and arm wrestling matches and stuff like that and I did that as a quick throwaway sort of thing, and I didn't think too much of it. And the players loved it. They were really into that. And we've had other sessions where there's a lot of more interaction with NPCs and carousing and, and, and buying things in shops. And, you know, we don't do that every week, but once in a while, it's good to be able to go to one of those things if one or more of the players or the DM is not quite there for it. Mm -hmm. um, so it's it's good to have in your, your, your bag of, of tricks. Now... We've talked about how you can have PC death in the game. Do you think you can have too much of it in a game? I feel like there there is sort of that sort of that line that you can eventually cross where either the game isn't balanced or you're running a very very like meat grinder type game and if you I feel like that's like the flip side where if you don't express that that's the type of game you're running people might also feel upset and that's a little bit more warranted because mm -hmm. if you're like oh, no I have the whole party TPK every every <laughs> night TPK and people don't know about that they might spend too much time like oh I'm, I'm rolled up this character and I'm oh nope your character is dead immediately oh yeah I can't imagine the original Tomb of Horrors the way it's written the idea is that you would show up with your characters from a campaign <laughs> that you somehow got up to high level and they're all going to die, right? Like Gary Gygax just wants to kill all of them. I think that's the situation where it would probably work better as a one-shot convention mm -hmm. type game. You're not really, really playing with your character you've been playing with for two years and if they die here, that's them. That's them yeah. done. They went to the Tomb of Horrors and, and they died. I know that some games like Dungeon Crawl Classics have what they call the funnel, where you start with a, a whole group of characters, mm -hmm. and, and you expect most of them to die, and the one who doesn't is the one who becomes your first level character. And I think you can do that, but it works better if you, you go into a sort of a black comedy, gallows humor type mm -hmm. approach to that. I think that if people are actually rolling up characters and putting in effort to give them a backstory or whatever else, and then they get about 20 minutes of play and then they're dead <laughs> week after week. I think it 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 will, they'll stop caring mm -hmm. as much. And so I think the risk would actually, that, that sense of, of tension and, and excitement about the game would kind of go away. 
Because are they going to die? Yeah, of course yeah, they yeah. are. And they, they have w- every every week for the past eight months. They've always died. Yeah, I've had like dozens of characters at this point. <laughs> yeah, and I think that in that situation, it's that would be too much. And I would suggest look at the way you're setting up your scenarios. I don't. I don't think it's usually the game system in that case. Mm-hmm. It's it's usually the the kind of scenario you're running. It could be an adversarial dungeon master who, for whatever reason, has decided that they win if all the other characters die. Never had I've, I've not had the, the bad fortune of, of being in a game <laughs> like that, and I don't I don't miss that. But I suppose it it must exist somewhere. So is it okay to have on the flip side of that? A D&D game. So there's other games out there, right? You could play Toon or you could play Teenagers from Outer Space or all sorts of other games. But is it okay to have a Dungeons and Dragons game where characters can't die? I think at this point, Dungeons and Dragons is like the, it's like the, almost like a big figurehead for tabletop role-playing games as a whole. And I feel like there's, you see a lot of stuff online where people will be like, oh, I love this this game system, so I'm going to modify it to make it what I like. And then there's people who are always like, oh, just play another game system, play another game <laughs> system. And I'm like, yeah, they probably would be better to play another game system. But at the end of the day, if it's making them happy, it's making them happy. It doesn't bother. It's uh, Superficially, of course, it could bother you. Mm-hmm. But at the end of the day, it shouldn't actually be bothering you. You don't really know this person. They're just somebody online. If they want to turn... D and D five E into I don't know Star Wars. Let them turn D and D five E into Star Wars if they want to play. I don't even know some Animal Crossing. Yeah, they want to play like Animal Crossing, the role playing game using the five E rules. Just let them if they're having fun. Then it doesn't really affect you. You don't have to play games with these people. Just sort of let them do that. Yeah. Are, and again, there are systems that would handle things like that a lot better and. In many cases, they, they probably, if they're spending that much time, they probably should, you know, <laughs> take a look at mm-hmm. what's out there um, to sort of help them run games that are more in line with the sort of uh, style they want. But if you're playing a D&D game and everybody agrees that they don't want players to die and players don't die, I feel like that's such a minor change that it's really, I don't have a problem with it as mm-hmm. long as everybody sort of agrees to it beforehand. Yeah, I think the agree to it beforehand is a really big part of all of that. And you either need to do that through that session zero idea or you need to really communicate mm-hmm. ahead of time. This is the way the game is going to be. Look, the dice are in the open. This is the rules we're using. Or, hey, everyone, don't worry. You know, <laughs> um, if, if you're at zero hit points, you're knocked out. And it's never worse than that. Just a simple comment like that. Like, this is a house rule. Zero hit points means you're knocked out. No one's dead. You get up, you wake up in the hospital. It's no big deal. Don't worry, everyone. Mm -hmm. I remember when I was a kid, we played the Marvel Super Heroes role-playing game. And we ran one of the published adventures where, I think it was the West Coast Avengers, went up against the Mandarin. He's the guy with all the, the power rings. And we were playing the game, and one of the, the player characters got hit with the disintegration ring. And they critted, like they, they, they rolled like, like maximum, and they disintegrated one of the heroes. And it was a real kind of like, whoa, like this is a character's <laughs> in the comic books. What, what, then now they're in our game, they're dead? And it, I think at the time we, we didn't love it. And we felt like it it didn't fit. And I think it's because it didn't work with the genre we were trying to emulate, right? So characters sometimes do die in comics. Now, at the time we were playing, they they hadn't started killing them off left, right, and center <laughs> like they did like into the 90s. So there wasn't as many character deaths uh, at, at that point. But I think if you're playing like a four-color superhero comic, you don't want... Spider-Man is swinging in to, to stop a bank robber and the bank robber, blam, blam, blam. Oops, Spider-Man's dead. <laughs> you yeah. know, that might be, that might not 
be the kind of, of, of game you're looking for, right? I think, mm-hmm. I think that would probably be better served by Spider-Man's in the hospital. Oh, no. And That's... now you've got to play some other character who's going to have to fill in for Spider-Man until he gets better. And, it, and that's the thing as well, is like if he does die, that changes the entire dynamic. Like mm-hmm. if you look at movies like End of the Spider-Verse, and it's not really a spoiler. It happens in the first like... Spoilers, everyone. Spoilers. Yeah. <laughs> happens in the first like 10 or 15 minutes. And the movie's been out for years at this point. If you haven't seen it, go watch it. It's really good. But <laughs> <laughs> I, I feel like that changes that changes the tone of the movie. And yeah. it sort of establishes what kind of movie it, it might be going forward mm-hmm. involving things like character death. And so, again, it's going to change drastically the type of game it is that you want to play. Um, and even the kind of tone you're trying to establish if one of these characters just straight up dies. Yeah. I mean, a, a movie like The Suicide Squad, one Suicide Squad and the other's The Suicide Squad, the newer one, yeah. for sure. The characters are dying left, right, and center, mm-hmm. right? And it's a, still a superhero movie. And so uh, you, there's a lot of range for, for tone, but I think if you go in expecting one thing and you get something else, that's where I think there can be problems. And I definitely see that in the style of some of the, the fifth edition artwork, I'm, mm-hmm. I'm very aware, based on the style of the art, that there's different groups of people looking for different things. Some of it has a real friendly, after-school, special cartoon kind of vibe to it. And then there's other artwork where it's survival horror and mm-hmm. characters are going to be dying all over the place. So, yeah, I, I do think it's it's okay f- for there to be games and D and D games where the characters can't die as long as everyone kind of understands. Cause if you think it's going to be the rule book that you've been mm-hmm. preparing for and you're, you're doing all this stuff to, you know, reduce your risk and, you know, thinking tactically and everything else. And there was a big safety net the whole time. <laughs> you might actually feel disappointed that you didn't put that energy into just doing a funny voice. Mm-hmm. Right. Like, like, ah, I spent all my time, like keeping track of my inventory and thinking about tactical movement on the grid and things like that. Instead, uh, I should have had a funny voice. And, you know, you would have had more fun with the game if you had understood what the what it was all about, right? So I think because of that, there needs to either be a discussion ahead of the game or you need to just clearly communicate the, the, the type of game and whether player character death is going to be an option before you get started. Now, one of the techniques that I see people advocate a lot, and hot take incoming uh, (laughs) because this is not a thing that I like, is pretending that the characters can die. And meanwhile, behind the DM screen, fudging, which is another word for cheating, fudging those dice to make it so that they never do die. So Mm -hmm. you pretend that there was a risk, but there never was a risk. And I really don't like that technique. (laughs) I would much prefer people to be honest and upfront and say, hey, this is the game. Zero hit points, you're unconscious. No one's going to die. Or zero hit points, (laughs) you know, you're making death saves or Mm -hmm. or whatever else. What's your take on that? I know already in the comments, people are going to be very upset with with us (laughs) saying this because I don't know a lot of people feel very strongly about this but I do have to agree with you about just the I don't like it when people fudge dice I think I I must have been like 11 or 12 I think I fudged a couple of dice in Mm -hmm. my time Mm -hmm. but then I stopped and my games improved because of it and then I ditched the DM screen Mm -hmm. because I had nothing to hide anymore Mm -hmm. and my games improved drastically it was just a huge improvement and I always see people online suggesting oh well the DM has to be this like storyteller and the dice are just there to to sort of determine what you want and you get to like change it if you think it would better suit the story and at that point why are you using all the rules yeah because like if you're rolling if you're rolling for something, you should just, like, go through with it. If you really want something to happen, if you really want, oh, no, the, the evil warlord, he escapes. Say say that it's like a cutscene, you guys. It's like a cutscene, yeah, he escapes. Because yeah. they do that in games all the time, like video games all the time, where you'll be like, my character is this, like, 
badass. He's mowed through like hundreds of enemies, and yet somehow this one guy keeps always escaping. Mm-hmm. Like he was right there. Why didn't he shoot at him? Yeah. Why didn't he do it? Well, it was a cutscene. So if you need something to happen, just do it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> like you know. And I think if you need to change something because you you're playing the game and oh they failed their death save. And they're supposed to be dead, but I don't really want them to be dead because it's Jane's aunt's in the hospital or mm-hmm. Tim's dog just died or, or something. And we, we just want to keep that out of there. And instead, you're going to do a G.I. Joe the movie and uh, Duke's in a coma. You know, you, you, you change <laughs> yeah. the voiceover. The character was supposed to be dead. You, you're going to change what it says. And we did that in one of our games that I was running for the kids. I, so I killed... I didn't kill, the dice killed (laughs) many of the PCs uh, during that run. But we had one player who was really reckless with his character. And I thought, he's just going to be reckless with the next character too. So we're going to have this recurring suicidal type character. And so instead, he came back as a zombie. Mm-hmm. And and so he was all like messed up, and and so it was funny again with the the, the black comedy gallows humor. <laughs> he was he was all messed up, so he died, right? But mm-hmm. we found a way to let that player continue with that character, right? So mm-hmm. Lord of the Rings, Gandalf dies, but Gandalf comes back. Mm-hmm. He, he he's not Gandalf the Gray anymore. He's Gandalf the White. Maybe the character comes back as is, is a zombie. Maybe they they had to be in the you know the hospital for a month and they come back with an artificer created hand or something like that. You mm-hmm. know, but, but I think that's okay because the players understand that where the game system where they they lost by the game rules. Right, their character died. Mm-hmm. Right. But the story is going to continue anyway, and that that's where the dungeon master is stepping in and, and, and altering something. But it, I think the idea that we're going to pretend, oh, that was a lucky roll, he almost hit you, and I, I think the players eventually catch on to that sort of thing. It's like at um, like poker games. People yeah. have tells yes. for these sort of like these sort of things. And I was playing a card game just recently, like a couple of weeks ago. And the person who was immediately next to me knew that I was bluffing. And they told me afterwards, my pupils like dilated quickly or something like that. I didn't even realize that yeah. I was doing that. And you have no control and over yeah, that. Yeah, you don't have a control over that. And yet people, I, and I was, I was bluffing. Yeah. And they immediately knew that I was bluffing. Yeah. And so I feel like a lot of people like to think they're better at hiding. <laughs> <laughs> I think if they were so good that they should be... In Vegas, yeah. winning mad cash, yeah. right? If they are that good at bluffing. And I think it's one thing to do it once or twice. Mm-hmm. The longer it goes, people are going to notice patterns. Mm-hmm. And I think even if they go along with it because they enjoy your company or they enjoy the overall story, it is diminishing that 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 sense of tension and uh, excitement in, in the, the mechanical portion of the game with the dice rolls. And so... I would rather almost any other technique, including straight up, just mm-hmm. narrate the whole thing. Say, if you need them to be captured, and instead of playing out a dice fudged you know, thing where they, they're, they're knocked out or whatever, just, just describe what happens. And then when it's time to play the game by the rules, just do it that way. I, I, think, uh, I think there's nothing, nothing wrong with that. Now, if a player character dies in the game... One of the complaints is, you know, if you're if you're there to play with your friends, and it's going to be a three or four hour session, thirty minutes in, their character dies, mm-hmm. right? And you've decided you're going to play with the dice in the open, and they're just that's it. Yeah. Now, do you tell them to go go take a hike or sit on the couch and watch, or what other techniques would you recommend? I feel that's definitely one of those like hard situations mm-hmm. where. I like short sessions personally, mm-hmm. and I feel like if something like that were to happen, I'd shorten the session sort of even <laughs> even more than usual. Like, I wouldn't be like, okay, session's over for today, but I'd like shorten it to be like another hour, maybe half an hour afterwards that people keep on playing. Um, unless the person is like fine with it, and they maybe they even roll up another character and they just show up. <laughs> yeah, I've seen people do that where during that downtime, it's a great, here's the book, yeah. get started on your next character. Some scenarios have NPCs. We had, in our games, frequently 
retainers and NPCs Mm -hmm. that people could take over. We had a game that we played at a convention last summer where one of the the player's brothers showed up at the table Mm -hmm. and we let him take over playing uh, an orc that we had charmed. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, that was that was fun. So I, I, I like that idea that they can take over playing some of those background retainers and villagers and things like that. Mm-hmm. I've also seen, uh, I think I've also done this, where you can let them take over one of the bad guys. <laughs> and it's interesting, the different personalities of players where some would take it a little easy on the players mm-hmm. and the others will go harder than you would <laughs> as the DM. <laughs> <laughs> They're like... It's like in 5e, like somebody's down, I go for the killing blow. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's like, oh, oh my goodness, what the heck? And then the, the player's like looking at this person, they're like, don't do, you effort, you effort. <laughs> and then you've got like that going on. Yeah, so so that adds a, a different dynamic to the game as well. If you if you let them take over some of the, the, other, the other characters in the game. Would you run a one-shot or convention game? In the same way that we've described, differently or or the same as your 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 regular games. I feel like you can't have a session zero really for a like a convention sort of game or one shot. Yeah. Well, a one shot you can, but convention game not really. So I definitely feel that for for me, I'd sort of I'd go in there sort of expecting the quote unquote default approach, which is sort of what it says in the books. And that's sort of how I'd run it. Mm -hmm. Even if I want to run it in a different way, I'd sort of be like, this is the rule system I'm running. I'm going to run it with the tone that's established in the book so that other people can sort of have this this general idea of what to expect just based on how the book sort of lays everything out. So, yeah, yeah, I feel that I definitely, like, I, I wouldn't be trying to safeguard anybody, especially in a convention game. If a player character dies, it's not that huge of a deal because, <laughs> like, it's a convention game. It's not like they were playing this character for a long time. It's, yeah. You might you might play a game afterwards with that same group of people. You might even play with the same characters. But if you're running a convention game and somebody's character dies, that really shouldn't be, like, a big deal, especially if they've only been playing for, like, an hour or two. Yeah, I, I would say that if I was running a session in a convention game, I'd I, like you said, you can't do... You can't do that sort of session zero in advance. So you have to really communicate ahead of time what your game is about. So I would keep it to the default as close as I could. Like if I, I say we're, we're going to run Call of Cthulhu, well, it's going to be Call of Cthulhu and you're going to have to make sanity checks and there's going to be monsters and, and unspeakable horrors and your characters are going to go crazy and die and things like that. But if I was going to change something about a game... I would want to communicate that ahead of time so that the right people signed up for that that game, mm-hmm. right? So if I wanted to play a game where there's no character death and I want it to be really friendly and, and light and a little on the silly side, I would want to communicate that as well as I could in the description of the game so that the right people come. You don't want people who are looking for survival horror showing up at the, you know, the light, silly, funny voices, NPC, talky yeah. game. And, and at the same time, you don't want the, the sensitive players coming to the Tomb of Horrors game and they get killed, you know, five minutes into the game and feel very disappointed. I, I feel like that's almost part of the thing is people have these different tones that have almost been established through their own group that they've been playing with for such a long time where mm-hmm. you'll see things online. There's a lot of talk about the, the, at this point, famous NPC who sort of, I guess, exists in many different campaigns at this point, Boblin the Goblin. Okay. If Boblin the Goblin were to ever show up in, in one of my games, I've been possessed and it's not me anymore. <laughs> <laughs> so somebody get help. Um, but like on a more serious note, I feel like people have these different, sort of almost different games that they're playing yeah. and they expect when, and I feel like this is the basis of a lot of online arguments where people will like, be debating these things of like no this is a silly game no it's a serious game and people are having these these big debates online it's both because the different people are playing almost a different game yeah. and so that's why i like to take that middle ground approach of what it says in the book is the sort of tone i'm going to run it with especially at a convention yeah i think dungeons and dragons certainly when i started back in the the 1980s and and i think it continues through to today there's there's the, the rules as presented in the books. 
And then there's like a folk tradition of the people that introduced you to the game, and they were telling you this is how it works. Remember, rule zero says the dungeon master can do whatever they want, and they can throw out any of the rules. Well, that's that's not in all RPGs, but some people believe it is, Mm -hmm. you know, because of that folk tradition that they believe they can, you know, chuck any rule into the garbage whenever they feel like it. I agree with you. I think a lot of the online arguments are people think, well, every single time I've ever played D&D with all my friends, it's been like this. Mm -hmm. And now someone's saying they want to play a completely different way and they're wrong. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) They're wrong and they're stupid Mm -hmm. uh, for wanting to do that. And now I'm going to get angry and and, and fight with them. So before we wrap up our episode, what other things could happen in a game that the players might fear more than character death? What could you put in a game to make it scary or tense or exciting without them losing their character to PC death? This is going to sound really effed up, but in some cases, maiming can actually be more scary than if your character dies. Mm -hmm. If they lose, like, an arm, people will freak out even (laughs) if they haven't died. Yeah. Yeah. Like, they're going to lose it, especially if it's, like, and depending on the tone, they could show up next time and they have, like, if you're playing high fantasy or cyberpunk or whatever, they show up with their cool hydraulic, like, prosthetic arm now. Yeah. And they're, like, it's, it's part of their, like, cool new, like, character... I don't know development, I guess, but especially in lower like fantasy settings or even like more modern settings where prosthetics aren't at that level, mm-hmm. it's it's scary. That idea. I think I think anything that diminishes their character mm-hmm. can sometimes be scarier than character death. We had one player where the party had found a a, a magic fountain in the dungeon, mm-hmm. and when you drank from the fountain, you would roll on a table to see what happens. And sometimes you could have your ability scores go up. And if you rolled poorly, you could sometimes have them go down. And this one player rolled poorly. I think he lost minus one. He was a wizard. I think he lost minus one to his strength, which really doesn't make (laughs) much of a difference. But it upset him, I think, more than if his character had died. And within... I think two sessions, he asked me, uh, can, I, can I start with a new character? Mm-hmm. He, just, he just voluntarily retired that character and started with a new one at first level. So he, you know, it was the same as character, but it was worse. It was worse than character death for him because he, he voluntarily said, I don't, I don't want this anymore. I'm going <laughs> to retire this character. It's, it's almost the same as, like, if you take elements from their backstory... It's kind of overplayed at this point. Like, you see a lot of memes about it online of, like, oh, it looks like this person mentioned their character's parents. Oh, no, <laughs> yeah, yeah. And like, it's overplayed at that point, and that's one of those those things as well where at some point you might just be getting mean and petty about yeah. it, and I feel like that's a really easy line to cross, but there are certain things like that. I'm not suggesting you go out and do that, because to me that just seems like a mean sort of thing to do, mm-hmm. but... There are certain things that people might be more afraid of than the characters dying. Absolutely. I think that the the risk with some of that is if if the players think you're going to go after their backstory mm-hmm. too much, they'll give you no the, backstory. the Batman. Yeah. You know, I'm, I'm dark and brooding and I have no family and I'm just singularly devoted to my cause of killing evil. There's different types of players who have different sort of mindsets. And there's almost some players, even if they're not playing physically like a samurai character, they almost have that like samurai mindset of, I don't care if my character dies, but they need to die doing something cool. And they need to not be like humiliated by an enemy. Yes. Or yes. It's almost like I'm imagining in one of the Middle Earth video games. Uh, I forget if it's, it might be both Shadow of War and Shadow of Mordor, but definitely in at least one of them, the orcs can be about to kill you, and then they'll just decide, like, you know what? No, you're not You're not even worth my time. I'd, I'd ruin my blade slicing your pathetic skin or whatever, and then they just walk off, and you're like, that? Ooh, I'm going to get that guy. <laughs> yeah, that's a, that's a good... And they do that in comics a lot. Mm-hmm. You know, when a character is defeated, the, the villain doesn't impale them or something like that they just taunt them a little bit and Mm -hmm. like look how weak you are and how easy this was for me and then they (laughs) walk away and i think that can sting for some players more than if their character had died so yeah i think there's options there 
Mm-hmm. Well, good discussion, and I'd love to hear from people in the comments how they view death and dungeons and dragons and whether they include character death as part of their games or if they've house ruled it out or if they do the terrible, terrible thing and fudge those dice and uh, <laughs> pretend that the characters can die when they really can't. Oh, you're just really lucky, man. You're really lucky. <laughs> Look at that. I rolled, a, I rolled badly again. I don't know what it is with these dice tonight, guys. You guys are just so lucky. Meanwhile, your pupils are dilating like crazy. <laughs> <laughs> You're, you're like checking, you're, you're looking down, looking back up, looking down, looking back up. <laughs> All right. Thanks very much, everyone. And we'll talk to you again soon.